Hi friends, welcome to another edition of the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series. We're so excited to be with you today and to share with you our guest who is Maureen Hart, the Executive Director of the International Society of Sustainability Professionals. She's been in that role for four and a half years and has been in the arena of sustainability, generally speaking, for about 25 years, in fact, more than 25 years, and brings an incredible diversity of expertise, uh, including uh, an expertise in data management and working with sustainability indicators. And Maureen is the author of the Guide to Sustainable Community Indicators. Maureen, it is such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for joining us in this discussion. Well, thank you, Aaron. I'm delighted to be here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. You know, I'm, I'm struck that through ISSP, you are working with professionals in a variety of industries and sectors all over the world. And, and what seems to be emerging there is truly a network, we could almost think of it as an ecosystem of practitioners and, and professionals. And tell us about that. What does that look like? You know, it actually is wonderful to have all those connections. Um, it does mean sometimes I have to get up early. Like this morning, I had a meeting with people in Europe. It was at 7 a.m. And, um, you know, sometimes I have meetings with people in Asia Pacific, and it's at 10 p.m. So, um, but it's wonderful because these people are doing such amazing things in so many different industries and in different countries um, and different aspects of sustainability. So some people are working in uh, product design. You know, how do we make packaging that works better and is not plastic and it's not going to end up in the, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Um, or how do we um, make our buildings more efficient? Or how do we generate less waste? How do we make our social systems more sustainable? So it's, it's an incredibly diverse group of people and skills, and it's really wonderful when they get together and share it. So we actually now have a, um, what we're calling regional learning networks where people are getting together virtual, sort of like this, um, where they, they get together. In fact, the meeting this morning was a group of ISSP members in Europe. Um, so there was somebody in uh, the French Alps, somebody in Switzerland, somebody in uh, Greece, somebody in the UK, um, and they're all having a conversation about something and sharing best practices with each other. So it's, um, it's a really wonderful, diverse, and um, very engaged group of people. It's absolutely amazing. And, and just to flesh this out a little bit more for our audience, you're working with professionals that are in the the private sector uh, and corporations and industry, individuals in uh, university and educational sectors, the NGO sectors, and governmental sectors. Is that right? Absolutely. So in people who work in hospitals or people who are trying to make uh, municipalities more sustainable, um, you know, working, we have some members who work for, for port authorities. So they're working on how do you make airports or, you know, uh, the water ports more sustainable. So it, it's an incredibly diverse, you know, we have people working in private schools, um, you know, helping, you know, 10 year olds figure out how they can make a, the world more sustainable. So it, it's, um, it, it is incredibly diverse. You know, some people are working on um, communication. How do we get people to understand that we need to be changing the way we're doing things and, and improving our systems? Um, you know, so it's, it is a really diverse group. And, it, and, and I guess one thing I'd like to say to your audience is, regardless of what you do and what your interests are, you can be contributing to sustainability and should be. Yeah, you know, I, I absolutely love and resonate with that point and uh, want to mention something along those lines. But before I forget, I want to make sure to tell our audience that ISSP runs a certification, a credential program. And Maureen, you have been kind enough to extend a discount to our listeners, the first 25 people 
who sign up and join uh, the ISSP. We'll talk about the details a little bit later on, but just want to make sure that uh, you all know about that special perk from today's discussion. And thank you for that, Maureen. That's wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, to your point about how important it is, essential really, that we think of the sustainability functions in all sectors, really. It's something I wrote about in, in Why on Earth, and specifically in that uh, section, that third section that dealt with uh, work and earning and our engagement with the economy and really thinking about how we create more uh, cyclical and circular and regenerative uh, economies and economic behavior in the broad sense of the term in that many of us, regardless of whether we're accountants or communications specialists or educators or manufacturers, whatever it may be that we're, we're doing in terms of technical skill sets, more and more of us are engaging in sustainability and stewardship through all those different channels. And it seems that you, you are at such an amazing nexus point of that fast emerging and, and growing phenomenon. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, our members are uh, engaging in a, a key part of what they do is work to engage others in their organizations or in their communities and try and um, figure out how to get everybody involved in this because it's not something that one person in an organization can solve. Everybody has a part to play, whether, you know, in a, in a business, if you're the purchasing manager, then you need to be thinking about where are the products you're purchasing coming from? How have they been sourced? Are they um, renewable products? Are they uh, compostable? You know, what happens to them at the end of their life cycle? Um, how are they being produced? Who's, you know, the, is there slave labor um, or child labor being used to produce them? Um, is there a lot of pollution generated when they're produced? But, you know, so the, the purchasing person has to think about it, but um, also the HR person has to think about it because they have to make sure that everyone in the company is trained on sustainability and understands how it fits into what they're doing. You know, everyone has a piece that they can play. Um, and so, it, what's really wonderful is you know, the training courses that we have help people understand where they fit into that, but also what they can do. So right now we're running a course on sustainability planning. Um, next month we're doing one on sustainability management systems because it's one thing to do a plan, but if you don't have a system in place to actually implement the plan and make sure that you then, you know, any plan that you put in place, you then have to do it, and then at the end you have to check to make sure that you had some results and revise it, you know, so there's a whole process for that. And we, then the next course we have is on leadership skills, how you can be a change agent within your organization or within your municipality. Um, so it's, it's very, um, you know, that, that's part of what we do is empower the professionals to be able to make change. It's so beautiful. And, and to be able to provide expertise and methodologies that, help folks really up their game, up level their capability right. is obviously uh, such a huge value. It's clear that the market is shifting more and more in this direction and that folks who have not only the credentials, but the access to the additional resources and capabilities are going to have additional competitive advantage out there basically. Yeah, yeah absolutely. In fact, on our website, we have recordings of webinars that we've done recently with different, um, with credential holders in different industries. So we have one for people that are in higher education, one that for um, credential holders in local government, and two that are for consultants, where they talk about what they see as the value of the credential in, in, in furthering their um, career, but also in how getting the credentials help them to better understand what they were doing and have better skills to do it. Um, and, so, and actually they also talk a little bit about their journey, you know, how they got to those, those points in their life. And that's actually a lot of fun to listen to is the trajectory because we have one person who got um, a degree in philosophy and now he's a facilities manager, right? We have someone else who got a degree in religion. 
You know, it's like, it's just amazing. You know, and then there are people that got degrees in engineering um, or in journalism. And so it's, it's really an amazingly diverse group and it's just fun to listen to how they got where they are today. Um, Cause I think it inspires everyone to see that they can do it as well. That's so beautiful. Well, I guess we could, uh, we could quip that perhaps all roads can lead to sustainability and, and hopefully will. <laughs> You know, yes, and they all need to. Absolutely, I agree. Let me ask you about your journey. Speaking of journeys, uh, how did you, how did you end up as the executive director of ISSP? Tell tell us about that. You know, um, I started off in information management and was doing um, database work for the US EPA, um, particularly in the area of um, hazardous materials management so they had a database on that and I decided I needed to go get a degree in that area because I didn't really I, I knew it was bad stuff but I didn't really understand all the, the, the issues with it so I went back to school to get a master's in hazardous materials management in civil and environmental engineering and while I was there at Tufts University there was a group of people working on sustainable community indicators and I thought, oh, indicators, I, I do data, I know how about that. And what I wanted to do is, um, you know, the problem with data and indicators is people go, oh, we've got to measure everything so we know what to do next. And the problem is, you never have enough data. And if you spend all of your time collecting more and more data, you know, what I call feeding the data monster, yeah. um, you'll never actually make a decision. You'll never actually start doing anything. So I said, you know, I, I could help communities that are working on sustainability, help them think about why they want to measure something and help them define the real goals they want and then what's the least amount of data that they want to collect. So I ended up writing the Guide to Sustainable Community Indicators and then did a lot of work with the US EPA. I did a, a bunch of train the trainers around the country on, you know, what is a sustainability indicator and how do you use it? and you know, what, how do you decide what's the right ones for your community? I also worked with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, and then I got involved with, I, I was a member of ISSP, and I got involved with some work that two of the founders put together, um, a sustainability assessment tool that was very high level. Um, and I call it a, a cross between a Myers-Briggs for organizations and a reading readiness test. Because what it does is it looks at an organization and says, you know, of all, of all the different functions you have in the organization, you've got senior management and HR and purchasing and facilities managers, they're all doing something. And they all have different roles to play. And each of those roles has different levels that they could be at. And they could be at, you know, not even starting, or they could be really, just, you know, well along the path. It's sort of a maturity model. And so I started using that model with a bunch of my clients. And it was really wonderful because we could benchmark and say, okay, you know, in this particular area on, say, purchasing, you're doing really well because you're thinking about it. But, you know, in terms of educating your employees um, or having a vision for the corporation, you're really not that far. So it was a wonderful way um, to help organizations figure out where they could really have the most impact or what they really needed to work on most. And, and the point was not that everybody would get every one of those things to be perfect, yeah. right? You know, the example I always use is I'm never going to be a good basketball player. Uh -huh. I'm too short and I'm really not that coordinated. But there's other things that I do really well, right? And so that's what sustainability is about. Every organization has different ways that they're impacting the world in terms of sustainability, and that's what they should focus on. So if you're a law firm, your water use is probably minimal. But you may have a lot of paper use or you may have a lot of travel. Whereas if you are a food processor, your water use and your food waste is probably really high. You may not have a lot of travel, right? So it helps to people. So this is actually the longer story, right? So I got involved in that um, and used that tool. And now that's actually one of the tools that ISSP has. And then four and a half years ago, one of the founders who was the executive director at the time decided to step down, and I threw my hat in the ring, and here I am. Wonderful. Well, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions, uh, getting a bit more into some of the, 
details around the the value and the services that you offer. But before I do that, I just I, I have to ask, and I, I do this with some of my consulting clients, whether they're executives of larger companies and organizations or entrepreneurs with early stage ventures. Um, outside of your work part of your life, in your personal part of your life, how do you incorporate some of the opportunities for stewardship and sustainability that uh, perhaps reflects what you're doing professionally? In other words, if we were to take a walk with Maureen on the weekend or something, what does that look like? Well, actually, you'd have to have a bike. Okay. <laughs> Um, because what I like to do is take bike rides and I actually do try to bike to work. Um, I, I also, uh, I'm more apt to be walking in the woods, um, than going shopping. Um, and, and one of the things that I've been doing over the last few years is downsizing, um, figuring out what's the least I need, um, in terms of material goods to really survive. Because in fact, you know, um, it's the people you have around you and the friends and family that you have that really makes life worth living. Um, you know, this idea of, you know, he who has the most toys wins when they die. It's like, no, nah, it's not it. It's the friends and family that are around you. So, um, you know, that's, and, you know, obviously things like reducing water use, reducing waste. Um, I try to only buy organic food. Um, and although I don't, moment have um, my own garden. Um, I actually just moved to Pittsburgh and when I was living in Connecticut, I was part of a CSA. I was one of the managing organizers um, of, of a CSA that was providing organic food um, to the local community. Oh, that's wonderful. That is just wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I can, I can form a picture in my mind as you're describing that. Beautiful. And of course, in Pittsburgh, there are plenty of wonderful uh, forested walking trails. I understand it's one of the more forested uh, park uh, uh, rich uh, cities in our country. There are some great parks, yes. Yeah. Um, very hilly, so bike riding is um, not as easy as it was in Connecticut, but um, it's still a whole lot of fun. And they actually have wonderful rail trails here, so um, that's a really great advantage. Beautiful. Um, well, cool. Thank you for sharing. And there's actually a lot of sustainability going on in, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, there's a group called Sustainable Pittsburgh that I actually happened to do some consulting for about 10 years ago before I had this job when I had my consulting company. Um, and they have a sustainable restaurant program. And one of the things that I've, just recently they started putting on the bus stop, you know, then they had to add on the bus stop. They have a picture of a person eating something and it says, you know, Aaron eats that sustain, you know, like sustainable food, and so he eats at sustainable restaurants. This is just advertising around the town. Love it. And it's, just, it's just wonderful things going on here. Well, there's certainly uh, a, a particular power that food holds in connecting us more yeah. and more with soil and sustainability stewardship. Right. Yep. I want to ask, uh, of the many, many, many leaders and projects you're familiar with through uh, leading the ISSP, are there a couple that jump out at you as really wonderful examples, success stories that we might share with our audience? You know, I wouldn't want to say, oh, there's one or two because there are hundreds. Yeah. Um, but I think there, there are some wonderful examples um, that I would love to give. Um, one of them happens to be the president of the board. Uh, he works for a company called Hello Fresh, which is one of these food kit delivery services. Yeah. Um, and what they're doing is trying to figure out, you know, you get this box and it's got cold packs in it and, you know, it, it's got this packaging. And so what he's working on is how do we reduce the packaging so that there's less impact there? Um, but then also, how do we make sure that the food that's being provided um, organically grown, um, responsibly sourced. Um, so, you know, there's a whole lot of work going on around that. Um, you know, we have another member who works for Procter & Gamble, and he's working to make their products more sustainable. Um, 
And of course, uh, we had, I, I'm I was, sorry. I was just going to mention, of course, for folks who may not be aware, Procter and Gamble P and G is one of the largest consumer packaged goods uh, companies in the world. So that, that that's a place right. where that individual is hopefully able to have substantial impact. Right. Right. Yeah. And so actually, you know, there's another member who was working in packaging um, and has some great stories about how, um, how do we make the, the packaging more sustainable? But the reason you have the packaging is so that the food stays fresh, right? So because if you, and, and coffee is a really great example that she used, you know, those little um, coffee packs and like the Keurig machines, um, it seems really wasteful. And it'd be great. We actually, in this co-workspace that I'm in, we have um, a, a little pods that are mostly fabric, not um, the plastic thing. So that's an improvement. But her point was that growing coffee and then shipping it all the way to the U.S. takes a whole lot of energy. If you end up having to throw coffee out um, because you're wasting it, then you're, that's an unsustainable process. So... Uh, so that's, you know, it's one of these, sustainability is about a balance. How do we figure out the best way to do it? I mean, we could all just give up coffee, right? Because then we wouldn't have to transport it. But then the people in those areas that are growing it wouldn't have jobs. You know, so yeah. sustainability is about the system. We have to think about all those pieces. The other example that she gave me was um, bananas. You know, at one point, um, the company decided to wrap their bananas in plastic, and everyone was up in arms. It's like, Bananas don't need plastic, but in fact, this plastic kept them from over ripening. Yeah, and and so, and so the food waste. Yeah, you know, that way it wasn't wasted, right? But yeah. that's one of the issues about sustainability. You really have to think about um, how do you work with all the stakeholders. In that case, they hadn't worked with the consumers to to get them to understand why having plastic would work. So they ended up not doing that anymore. So it's, you know, sustainability is really complex, and there's a lot of education that we need to do, and we need to really bring in all of the different stakeholders to make sure that the solutions we come up with are going to work. I love that uh, through the International Society of Sustainability Professionals, with you and your colleagues, you are uh, bringing together so many experts and expertise, and it seems like it's one of those must have relationships and resources for more and more of us who are engaged in this uh, sustainability work. And I want, I want to mention um, that to our audience, uh, as a reminder, you're, you're tuned into the why on earth communities stewardship and sustainability series, um, our podcast series. And today we are speaking with Maureen Hart, the Executive Director of the International Society of Sustainability Professionals. And Maureen has shared a very special offer to us um, for this podcast episode, which is uh, a code, why on earth? If you go to sustainabilityprofessionals.org and click on the button to join, the first 25 people who do so will get a $25 discount using the code why on earth as they engage and look at uh, becoming members and uh, potentially getting the credential, the certification as well. I also want to mention that uh, on the whyonearth.org website, uh, specifically whyonearth.org slash market, we have a whole bunch of books and other products, printed books, audio books, ebooks, and uh, for those of you tuning in, if you want to use the code there, the code podcast, you can get a nice discount on the ebooks and audiobook products that we have available for you there. So just want to make sure uh, everybody knows about those resources. And Maureen, thanks again for that uh, generous discount. That's wonderful. Absolutely. And I just want to clarify, it's Y on Earth, but it's a capital Y and the rest of the letters are lowercase. Oh, good to know. Okay, I'll make sure that's clear in the... Uh, in the show notes as well. Um, I, wanna, I wanna ask, you know, as you're building this global network of experts, practitioners, and folks who are upping our games, what are, what are one or two of the biggest challenges that you're seeing for us professionals as well as for our societies, uh, generally speaking? 
You know, the, the biggest, we actually just did a survey of all of our members, and this is one of the questions we asked them. And one of the biggest issues they said was the lack of awareness huh. um, of the size and the scope of the sustainability issues and the need for action right now. And this is particularly a problem, problem given the current political climate. Um, you know, what we really need is more collaboration and cooperation in order to solve some of these problems. You know, and on, on the environmental side, we've got massive hurricanes and wildfires and um, floods. And here in Pittsburgh, we're having lots of landslides because of torrential rains. And so all of those things are, are caused by the climate change. But we also have other things happening like a declining pollinator um, populations, you know, bee, honeybees. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the things that we need to pollinate the food that we eat. Right. Um, and so it, this is changing our whole food ecosystem, which is going to be a problem. And then on the social side, there are issues with um, increasing income inequality and lack of trust and cooperation. And that's what makes a democracy function. Yeah. And so um, we really need to start working on those and, and so getting awareness out to people um, and finding ways to talk to each other. So that's really one of the biggest ones. Um, the other issue is that a lot of people think that sustainability is all about the environment. Right. And what I like to tell people is, you know, Mother Nature is going to be around long after we're gone. Uh -huh. Sustainability is really about our economic and our social system. And we have to understand that it's a system. Um, and so we have to figure out how do we make our social system and our economic system work within the environmental system that's there because, um, you know, it's, it's the laws of nature that are really, you, know, you can't repeal them, right? Gravity exists. You can't repeal the law of gravity and you can't change the way nature works. Um, so we really need to think about how do we um, change the economic and social systems. And um, one of the important things is to realize the social aspects of it, because poverty and income inequality are really driving a lot of the issues that we have. Um, you know, we in the U.S. have a very high standard of living. And it's not right for us to turn around to someone in a low-income country and say, no, 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 you can't, you can't have any of the things that we have, um, especially if these people can't you know, feed their families. If you can't care for your basic needs, take care of your kids, you're not going to care if a factory starts up that's polluting the, the environment, right? Because that's a longer-term issue, and you just want to feed your kids so you want a job, right? Yeah. So we need to think about how do we – make the economic system and the social system fit together. So, um, so that's the other thing is that people not realizing that, that social and, and, and economic issues are really the sustainability challenge. Another one is short-term thinking. Yes. And a lack of a systems view, right? Understanding that these things are connected. Um, you know, for example, in, our, um, in the corporate world, Many, most companies are driven by quarterly earnings reports. And that means it's really hard to make a decision that if we make this change to our process, which is going to have a really great reduction in, say, carbon emissions or waste, but it's going to be an economic payback that will take 10 years, then they may not do it because the shareholders are going to say, wait a minute, we need more profit, right? So there's that short-term thinking that we need to step back from and say, you know, it's okay. And that's actually one of the things that's happening is there um, are companies called B Corps that are benefit corporations that are being created where they're actually now, um, I don't know, it's something like 40 states have um, legislation that allows them. And that's, allowing companies to be set up so they can say, yes, we need to give benefits to our shareholders, but we can also think of social and environmental benefits, and that will count as well. So that's another um, interesting change that's happening. And then finally, the last really major challenge that sustainability professionals have 
is making the business case for sustainability. Um, you know, I was just talking about how do you, you know, put in some uh, program in place that's going to have a 10-year payback. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is, you know, we have these hurricanes and floods and landslides, and the cost of fixing all of that doesn't get factored into the price of oil or the price of energy, you know, or, or the cost of goods, right? So any pollution that's created in China to create low-cost goods that we then buy doesn't get factored into the price, but, you know, there are now some poor air quality days in California that are caused by pollution in China. It's a system, and we need to think about that. So how do we create these business cases and be able to factor in what those are called externalities, you know, how do we, those costs that we don't usually think of. Yeah. So those are really the biggest sort of global problems. The individual problems for the sustainability professionals themselves, um, you know, one is sort of isolation because a lot of companies have one sustainability professional, there's no one to talk to. And that's one of the reasons ISSP is a great organization because you can network with other people. You can talk about issues you're having and some will say, oh yeah, you know, I tried that, it didn't really work, so I did this instead. You know, so there's being able to work with other people. Um, expanding responsibility for sustainability, you know, getting it so that it's not just, oh, you're the sustainability director, you fix the problem. It's everybody's responsibility. So how do you expand it and bring in all of the stakeholders um, and all of the people within the organization? And that gets to changing co corporate culture. And so that's another big challenge that the individuals have. Is how, do, how do you manage culture change within organizations? And then there's just resources. Um, you know, getting the resources to put new projects in place, but also to maintain projects that you've already had going for a few years. Um, and this is actually something that we here in the U.S. have a lot of problem with. You know, all of our infrastructure is starting to crumble because we put a whole lot of effort, oh, you know, put a whole lot of money into building this bridge and then didn't think about how much it was going to cost to maintain it. Uh -huh. You know, so we, we need to be better at thinking about this. Again, that gets to the long-term planning. Yes. You know, long-term thinking is building the road is great, but then what's it going to cost to fix it? Well, so those are a lot of the issues that bigger issues and then individual issues. Thank you so much for walking us through that. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to encourage our audience, whatever it is you're doing, maybe you're an entrepreneur or Maybe you're working with a large corporation or a university. Check out uh, the ISSP, sustainabilityprofessionals.org, and be sure to take advantage of the discount code that Maureen has offered. You know, as you were describing, Maureen, the perspective that says sustainability is about our economic and social systems, I couldn't help but hear uh, some unspoken words threading through this. Words like, empathy and care and dare I say love. Uh, I am daring to say love more and more actually. It's curious to me looking at what the largest corporations are beginning to show in the way of shifts and changes, certainly where uh, consumer demand is shifting in a dramatic way. It seems to me that although the last 20, 25, 30 years have been marked by some deep institutional challenges to some of the positive changes we're describing now, it's very clear that the companies and organizations that don't start moving rapidly in the direction of sustainability are actually uh, potentially exposing themselves to enormous risks, uh, risks yeah. of market share loss, risks of loss of relevance, uh, risks of not looking like they're taking their responsibilities as fiduciaries, their responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis diligence, uh, their leadership responsibilities seriously. And as the world's waking up to this, I, I believe we're at such a potent nexus point. It's very exciting. And it means to me that more and more of us are going to need resources like ISSP to get the jobs done that we have in front of us. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, companies need to look at the risks because, you know, as we have more sustainability problems, you know, like huge hurricanes, you're going to have problems with your supply. You know, your supply chain is going to get broken. You're not going to be able to create the goods that you're trying to survive, you know, to, to use to, to um, 
manage your company. And so it's really important that companies look at all of those sustainability aspects. And you're absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely, Maureen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today for this discussion. And I know that there's a whole lot more we could be talking about. And I hope we have the opportunity to engage more deeply uh, over the coming weeks and months. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity if there's any uh, final message or thought you'd like to share with the audience uh, before we wrap up, please do. You know, I, I definitely want to encourage people if they're in any sort of professional area to think about becoming a sustainability professional or thinking at least about how you can incorporate that into what you're doing because there is something in your job that you can make better. Um, and also to think about how you can do it within your community because that's important, getting the word out there and getting people to think more about how do we make better communities um, and get involved get involved. Beautiful. Love it. Well, Maureen, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Aaron. I've enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm.